see you too. You look very fine. Uh, how are you? Good? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. So, A little, I, I think I get catch some cold, but I'm okay. I get okay. negative, negative, inshallah, inshallah. Okay. So. You're really welcome. It's a proud to see you here, and we are very happy to see that healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're ready to start. Okay, great. Okay, let's well, start. Then. Welcome, everyone, uh, to our third uh, seminar, webinar. Uh, getting Stronger Together uh, initiative. And this morning we're having another distinguished guest of ours whom we wish to um, host in Bezmalem in Istanbul, but we are hosting him in the webinar. And our topic is gonna be about updating asthma pathogenesis and management because this is his real research area and his life has been dedicated to research about this. Professor, uh, Kuteybe Hamid has served as a senior lecturer at the National Heart and Lung Institute in London and as a researcher on asthma and allergies from 1989 to 1993. Then he moved to McGill University in Canada at that time and he was appointed as an associate professor and then a professor of respiratory diseases. And he had many positions and chairs in respiratory medicine. And he was a member of McGill's Faculty of Medicine for over 20 years, and he ran the research lab for asthma and the other respiratory diseases for many years, and he has been awarded the Distinguished Scientist Award by Canadian Society of Clinical Investigations in 2014. Unfortunately, we were uh, lucky to meet him at his later research areas when he moved to Sharjah University, where, uh, whom we have collaboration with. And he's now the Vice Chancellor for Medical and Health Sciences and the Dean of College of Medicine in University of Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. And he is very well recognized internationally for his collaboration on research on asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and airway inflammation. And the floor is yours, but I have to remind our uh, followers that if you have any questions, please share with us. And at the end of the lecture, I will be forwarding all your questions to uh, Professor Hamid. Thank you, Professor Hamid, for being with us again. Okay. Uh, can you hear me well? Do you see my slides? Yes, we're seeing your slides. Thank you, and we're hearing you well. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Rumaita. It's been a pleasure to, to, to really uh, be with you. Although virtual, I would have loved to be uh, in Istanbul, uh, being in Istiklal Jadasi and uh, eating Turkish food, you know, uh, just those, uh, our relation with your university is solid and hope. And that's, Maybe for people who know I visited the place, you know, you are an excellent host for us. And uh, I'm talking to you from the University of Sharjah, which is uh, the biggest university in the UAE now, uh, with a, the biggest medical campus and active in teaching research. And we are collaborating, you know, with your university. So what I'm going to, to do today is to take you through a journey of how did we change our concept of asthma? You know, asthma, why asthma is important? How did we change our concept of the pathogenesis that led to the change in the management? Any research that is not having implication in the management of patient, I call sterile research. So I want to tell you how did research has led to the change in the treatment and also take a sort of lesson, how much patient you need when you do research in a disease complex like this one. So I'm going to check. Okay. So in the last, I mean, I've been doing research since 1990 in asthma and then in the last 10, 15 years, there's some good news and there's bad news. You know, asthma, there's a change in the epidemiology. 
At one stage, it was a disease of the West, of the developed country. And now, actually, it is disease of the Middle East, as you're going to see. And through Turkey, I speak about Saudi Arabia, and I speak about United Arab Emirates, and you're going to see the jump into the percentage of the disease. We have identified that there is a new trigger. Before we spoke only about allergy. Now we know there is a lot of other new triggers that came with the modern life that we are living. The good news is we understand asthma better. You know, I remember when I was a medical student, we thought of asthma as a muscular airway smooth muscle disease that airway constricts. You can to see how the we change our understanding using molecular techniques. How did this help us? The bad news is with the development of treatment and other things, we are seeing more cases which are difficult to treat. What we call in them severe asthma or difficult to treat asthma that I'm going to focus today on. The other new concept that I want to, to, to explain to you is the change of our understanding of asthma. Before we thought asthma is a single disease, now it is a syndrome. There's a number of phenotypes that as student, as a clinician, we have to understand the phenotype to apply the new treatments. And I will finish by telling you the new therapies, you know, as you all know, as is a bronchial constriction, we treat it with bronchodilator and with steroid, but now I want to show you how does this molecular technique end up with a new therapy that are used in Turkey, using like Arab Emirates all over the world, and uh, what are the basis for that? So that is the outline of my uh, talk. Now, if you look here, actually, uh, this is, I don't know about Turkey, but look, we are less, maybe you can correct me, but at least the place I am now working in, the percentage of the disease has really increased, you know, has increased uh, in the last few years, from 5% to almost 24% in Saudi Arabia. So there is really an increase in the number, particularly in the children. So if you go to this study, you can see 86, it was 8%, 24, 24, now 26%, now or even more than 26% of children have asthma. That is alarming. And the other thing is we, in spite of the development of the inhaled steroids, we still only can control 64% of the cases. So 31% of the cases are not very well controlled. So that is a problem. But so to, to really go further into this, we need to understand the pathogenesis of the disease. I remember a lot of you were young, including Dr. Maitre, when, when I started my research, we thought asthma is a genetic disease. And I remember when I was working at the National Heart and Lung Institute, we thought that we discovered the first gene and we thought, oh, we find the treatment. Just to tell you here, this is the number of genes that has been now discovered to be associated with the asthma. So certainly asthma is not a single genetic disease, something that we have to change the concept of other people. A lot of people say asthma is genetic. It is multiple gene there. And the number of mediators that are present there also. So it is, but genetic background is important, but genetic background with that environment changes would not lead, would not lead to us. So it is a combination of genetics and environment. So what has changed in the environment? Allergens, we are seeing more allergy in the, in the, and still allergy and atopy is one of the uh, main, in, main causes of interaction with genetics. But what have been changed in the last 20 years? We have moved a lot of from the villages, including in Turkey, in the United Arab Emirates, even all the world, in Germany, actually the first study, from the villages to the modern life. So the, 
That's what called the hygiene hypothesis. So our children are not exposed to the same microorganism that has been, we are, we, we are exposed to it. It has, that has disturbed our, the development of our immune system toward what we call as a, see later, TH2 type. So this is one of the things that's why we see in the cities like Istanbul or like Dubai here or like the, a surge in the number, particularly in children. Now our children, especially now with the lockdown, they live like in a theater, you know, they live socialized clean, they don't go play in the streets, they don't, a lot of vaccination, and that has disturbed the immune response and shifted toward what we call allergic type or TS2 type. I do not to tell Turkish people about smoking. When I visit Istanbul, many smokers. Not only cigarettes, but is it still available? Shisha, I don't know, but shisha rather. Smoking has become really, especially in this part of the world, more popular, particularly in the woman population. And that is really has led to decreasing the incidence of difficult to treat us. Excessive use of antibiotics. And I don't know again about clinical practice in Turkey, but in the Middle East, here in Arabic countries, you go to the pharmacy until recently and you get any antibiotic you want. A lot of children receive antibiotic, which is not needed for viral infections. And these antibiotics, they kill the flora of the, of the body and then again disturb our immune response. That's why now we introduce in at least in the IE that you cannot take an antibiotic without a prescription. This is a practice that has been, I mean, I've seen it in Canada in England for the last 30 years. So I hope that you know we can force our pharmacists not to get antibiotics because a lot of people for fever, for simple viral infection, they take antibiotics. And that's not going to help. It's going to actually disturb our immune system. Now, pollution is a major of the Middle East, problem of the Middle East. And that I don't know what the level there, but certainly that's a change in the environment. The type of food that we are eating, you know, I always say, my mother used to cook every day, my wife cook every other day, my daughter cook every week. So the thing there is that people are using a lot of this ready-made food. That is full of preservatives. Not only that, that can induce allergy, but also lead to obesity. And obesity is one of the comorbidity of asthma. In the Middle East here in the UAE, the percentage of overweight of the children is 34%. 34% of our children are obese. That's due to sitting at home, not a lot of activity, fast food, and my worry actually in COVID-19 that we're going to see this problem even worse. You know, there's a whole field of asthma and obesity. And actually, one, one of the researchers who's actually happened to be my daughter, she is all her career is about obesity and asthma in the female population. What else? It's things that I didn't see in Canada, I saw it here in the Middle East. I think there's little of it in, in, the, in, in Turkey, is this dust or sandstorms. You know, sandstorm has become a problem and we don't understand how does that affect the things. And this overcrowding, this, I mean, now we don't see it because of COVID-19. But people who have been to the Emirates and they go from Sharjah to Dubai, they would see, this is in Egypt actually. It could happen very easy in Istanbul. I saw Istanbul, the crowding there, you know, and this, all these cars with uh, causing pollutions and all this crowded. So this is the change in the thing there. What else unexpectedly that increased the incidence of allergy? We are seeing now more babies who are born through cesarean sections. So what is the relation of cesarean section and asthma? This is abnormal way, you know, of delivery. Through the normal way, the child, when he go out of his mother body, he will be exposed to a microbiome environment and bacteria through the passages. And he will start to develop his immune system or his immune system well. 
we found that people who go for cesarean section and now a lot of gynecologists, they push, go quickly for cesarean section, is that those people will develop more allergy because they are not exposed to this in daily life to this uh, things. Again, I would like to hear from Dr. Ramayza and others is vitamin D deficiency. I came to the UAE here thinking that everybody has a lot of vitamin D. Actually, it's alarming. 90% of the Gulf population have low vitamin D. And what does the vitamin D have to do with asthma? We know that vitamin D is an anti-inflammatory. And in fact, we just published a few papers looking at the level of vitamin D and replacing vitamin D in patients who have difficult asthma. And when we replace vitamin D, those patients improve. Unfortunately, once we stop the supplement, the patient will bad, not only clinically, but also on the biomarker. So you can see that in the last 20 years, all these new things. You know, there's other things like radiation and other things, but those are a major changes in the Middle East that has really led to the increase of asthma. It is now epidemic. I don't want to say pandemic, it is an epidemic now. And my worry in COVID-19, because people are not going to come early, we will see more difficult to treat asthma. So, the other thing that changed is all physicians, we were all treating asthma, we were treating symptoms. So we do not really treat the cause. What we do is if patients have difficulty in breathing, wheezing, uh, whatever, we treat that. And once the patient improves, we stop treatment. And or the patient themselves stop treatment. But under this is what I call the top of the iceberg. No. So we treat the surface, but for the symptom to appear, there's a series of processes going on into the lung that cause airway obstruction, which is mostly as you get to see inflammation. So the advice now with the new guidelines that we should continue treatment of anti-inflammatory, even if the patient doesn't have symptoms in moderate and severe asthma because we, we want to avoid exacerbations. If we have more exacerbation, this is like an injury. This is, you injure something, repair, injure, repair. It will cause, as you can to see, a very difficult phenomenon called airway removal. So that's why now that all the guidelines of called the goal of asthma management has changed from sort of like the over but achieving control to preventing excessive breaches. And you're going to see, actually, in the new treatment, most of the clinical trial is not about achieving control. It's about decreasing excessive breaches because that is the major enemy of asthma. So what is happening in the lung, you know? In the 70s and 80s, actually, it was difficult. We all depend on the clinical symptoms until we started. And I think we were the first group when I was in the prompting to introduce bronchoscopy for research to see what's happening in the lung. But before it was animal study, and I hope as my mice is different from a human. So we were the first one to introduce bronchoscopy to see what's happening in my modern That's it. And it was clear that the hallmark of asthma is this under the epithelium accumulation of large number of inflammatory cells. And for people who know histology, these are mononuclear cells and red cells here, not red blood cells. And those are actually T cell and the eosinophils. And become a eosinophil and T cell. A eosinophil is the effector cell. T cell is the orchestrator of inflammation. What other pathology you see there? You see detach of the epithelium. You see fibrosis going below the epithelium, and most importantly, you see increase in the smooth muscle mass. And this is important for asthma because when we have increased or remodeling of the smooth muscle, it makes the airway very easy to constrict and very difficult to uh, relax. 
So the two major features in Castella, if you want to treat us, is to control inflammation and to prevent airway remodeling. This is in addition to the acute treatment which to cause bronchial uh, dilation. Anyway, so remember, especially if we have students for us, that inflammation is the whole, hallmark of asthma. Now, what is causing this inflammation? And how does this inflammation, you know, we want to go inside. Now, T cell, which I said, is the orchestrator of the inflammatory response. And if in the 80s, in the 90s, we actually, that is one of the most highly cited papers that I published in the New England Journal, is we find that in asthma, there is a preferential expression of a number of cytokines. For people who know immunology, we know that there's T cell can be TH1 or TH2. I don't want to overwhelm you with the immunology, but I want to say that the TH2 here is an important and related to asthma. I mean, we went through many papers to show how to, these, these, those are old stories. And those are important, you're going to see, IL-4, because I, the reason I'm saying here, because this is related to the nutrient. IL-4 is an important cytokine for the production of IgE. And we know IgE is one of the major immunoglobulin that lead to the early phase reaction, and even late phase reaction. There's another cytokine called interleukin-5, and I'm going to explain that more, which is essential for eosinophil survival and recruitment. And then IL-13, we share some function with IL-4, and both of them, they work on epithelial cells, on inflammation, but also have relation to the mucus overproduction and to remodeling. So the theory came at that time, and you're going to see how this theory changed and for many years, that asthma is a TH2 disease, while other immune response like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculosis is more of what we call TH1 type response, which is a lot of cellular immunity there that's characterized by our clouds and it different on that. So this is the thing what we call the TH1, TH2 balance is disturbed. The normal is there is God creating us with a balance, everything balance in our system. So there is a balance. We need TH2, we need TH1, there is a balance in our immune. If you take T cell from a normal, there is a balance between the production of these cytokines. In asthma, in allergic rhinitis, in, for example, articaria, there is a shift and the predominance of TH2 type cytokine. So if we want to really treat asthma, we have to restore this balance for long term. That is the thing that has changed. Before is we just went to control the symptom. Now we want to look to restore this immune response. So we can restore it, we can prevent it, in controlling the environment. But a lot of the countries, they really have failed to control the environment. I think one of the few countries that control that is Norway or Finland, you know, but it's very difficult to control environments, for example, in Saudi Arabia and Iraq, I know that. So, so we have to shift our trying to do that pharmacologically. Because if we, for example, control the movement from this, from the rural area to the camp, to the cities, if we can prevent antibiotic, if we can control pollution, if we, yes, we can prevent this imbalance. But as you all know, this is a big task that we cannot do. So all these cytokines, I have five, I have four, I have five, uh, I have 13, they are secreted from different things. But at the end, can sort of like control this inflammation, but inflammation alone, it doesn't cause to you a problem because it's inside. It has to affect structural cells. And the structural cells, which is the one functional cells that cause the bronchial constriction, why should asthmatic suffer? This smooth muscle constraint. And if they don't relax, they go to status asthmaticus and they die. So all this lead to the effect of a smooth muscle to cause constriction. Remodeling, hyperplasia, hyperatrophy, or migration. And that is, in summary, the sort of the 
So until recently, the concept of asthma pathogenesis, I'm going to show you how this, and again, this change. So how do we treat asthma? If you ask any clinician, even sort of consultants, the major thing is to have what we call controller and, uh, and the relievers. So bronco director are relievers. You know, everybody hear about ventilin or about uh, sort of turbine, uh, like, you know, uh, all uh, for bitterol. Those are bronchodilators. So those are, if any, they have very little fecal inflammation. Those are given to relax the smooth muscle. The thing which we really need is anti-inflammatory products. We're going to see what are these ones. And the bronchodilator could be a short acting and a long or, 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 or long acting, you can see, Lama and Lama. And then at one stage, when I was in Montreal, actually, Marco Frost discovered the anti leukotriene which other indicators. They're going to tell you the limitation of using that you know, in the severe asthma. But the major one was steroids. And then there's many formulas for steroid in AM. But the one that created a lot of changes in our asthma engine is to combine bronchodilator, long-acting bronchodilator, and inhaled steroids. And you all familiar with, you know, GSK product, as a product, other people product, you know, which is basically, it's not a new invention. It is combining a bronchodilator, not the short-acting, long-acting bronchodilator, and anti-inflammatory in form of inhaled steroids. So what is the best way to treat us? You know, sometimes, if you look, you have to, there's many studies, and each one has smart study, focus studies, and it's all about how we use them in the morning, in the afternoon, the dose, and they are effective. But when we discover that even with the best, even in the best clinical trials, that 30% of asthmatic population are not responsive to this. They are high or hyper-responsive. So you give them a steroid, you give them bronchodilator, combination, optimal control, and they show resistance. It's not primary steroid resistant, it is hyper-responsive. And those are the people that have greater morbidity and disproportionate need for care support. If you go to the hospital, most of our spending is about those in control asthma. Mild asthma, moderate, can be treated in any family medicine, and they can live normal life. But when they go to the difficulty, those are the people we hospitalize, those are the people we give expensive drug, and most of the resources of the health system go. So those are an important part of our sort of population. However, before we say these are difficult to treat asthma or resistant asthma, we have to make sure that we are excluding other comorbidities. We have to make sure that the history is good, but the most important thing, there's few comorbidity conditions that we have to exclude and we have to treat. One of them, I am sure many of you, him and his family, have hyperacidity and reflux. And the reflex is one of the causes that really make asthma difficult to treat. And sometimes when we treat reflex by next term or by something else, we will improve. The other thing that we see and then we don't diagnose, and in our clinical trials, 30% of severe asthmatic have vocal cord dysfunction. And that's why it's important for those in clinic to see an ENT surgeon who will come and look to us into the clinic. Now, when the patient has rhinitis and sinusitis, you have to treat that before you say it's a asthma. A lot of people, they have cough, I think, because of the nasal drop of, from the sinus, or this mucus coming in the gator. So the combination, you know that 80% of asthmatic have rhinitis, and 40% of rhinitics and people with both have asthma, so we have always to look into this one. We certainly have to execute, you know, asparagillosis. Asthma and COPD are overlapping, and now there is a syndrome called asthma COPD overlap syndrome. 
So we have to exclude that. Now sleep apnea, you know, I have to ask the wife. Very few of us do not snore. At least my wife told me I'm snoring. You know, I don't tell her she's snoring, but she tells me I'm snoring. So the snoring is a major problem, but sleep apnea, almost seven to 8% of the population have sleep apnea, which is undiagnosed. And that if it's present will make asthma difficult to, to treat. And we have to exclude all psychological comedy. So after we executed all that, and the patient still does not respond to our inhalers, what should we think? How to deal with those difficult to treat asthma? So the first thing we discover and on stage and we publish a lot of papers is that we were depositing until recently the drug into the major airways, you know, thinking that asthma is only a major airway disease. So if you look, this is the surface area of the major airways. But all of these are small airways in dependent areas that for many years the drug will not deposit here actually. And what we find is a lot of patients who died from asthma, they died because they have a lot of problem with their small airway. This is a small airway constrict, small airway. And you just look to the inflammation around it here. And the deposition here, we need to get the drug deposited into the lung. And that's why the, this is the area for now improvement in our management where we reformulate the drug to be uh, warmer, lower volume velocity, smaller droplet to deposit in our lung. There's many pre preparation now in the market. In fact, the Japanese have gone all the way and they give the bronchodilator drug through the skin to reach this as well. Now, what if we give that and the patient still does not respond? Those patients most likely have steroid insensitivity. To understand that, we have to understand how steroid work. So steroid work, when we apply steroid by passing the, the cell membrane, finding the receptor called GR alpha, and that receptor will translocate to the nucleus, attach to the GRE element, start the process of limiting the inflammatory genes. But sometimes, and you're going to see why, there is production of an alternative supplies form called GR beta. Now this GR beta would compete with the GR alpha, make a complex, and then when it translocates to the nucleus, would not identify the GRE element and the steroid would not work. If you see this one, you give push, push this. You now if you give the maximum dose of the steroid and patient does not respond, don't give too much because you're only at the inside. So that is, you know, let us to think of other things. Can we use look at modifier? Not in severe asthma. It has limited effect. Can we use steophylline, the one, the very old, actually side effect, side effect is very high, and there's nothing to support using it in severe asthma. A lot of clinicians, and they found it in the Middle East when they came from Canada, they use oral steroids. Yes, it will work temporarily, but we have always student and early sort of condition and even our senior clinician to think what is the side effect of that. We see many patients of asthmatics with many patients of asthmatic with, with broken bone, with osteoporosis. So it's not very advisable to take that. So that led us to really to a big cohort of severe asthma in Canada. And we biopsy those severe asthmatics. It was a brave decision about 10 years ago. And we decided to see why these patients are not responding and what we were surprised to see in severe asthmatic, that what we were seeing in mild asthma of inflammation, in phyllic, T cell, smooth muscle, is not present in all these patients. In fact, we identify different phenotypes. So this is an asthmatic individual, and what you can see here, actually, for people who know astrology, this is a follicle, like lymph follicle, B cell follicle. And those patients, although they might have normal IgE, or actually, they produce a lot of IgE. This is very IgE, and those patients usually you get to see a response to anti-IgE. Our understanding that asthma is a eosinophilic always was not right. 
because we saw is river, but we see asthmatic which have neutrophils. And neutrophils, as you know, is very resistant to steroids. So now we are speaking about phenotype, PCL, sort of like IG producer, eosinophilic uh, dominant, neutrophilic dominant. But what is that surprise for us? We saw cases, a good percentage of cases, which there is not a lot of inflammation. There is, you know, in fact, when I look at it, you know, you know, I, I have a pathology also background. They look like a tumor of smooth cell, but they are very hyperplastic smooth muscle. So this is smooth muscle covering all the airway, and that was make it constriction. So this one, if you give it a steroid, it's not going to help. To help, we need another way to treat it. And in very few cases, we saw an extreme fibrosis like this. So this airway is fixed airway. Those are not proper. And this is supplemented by genetic study which show cluster of gene associated with one H1 RTS. So what should we do for those one which is high IG? So if you have an asthmatic who does not respond to inhaled steroid and it is high IgE protection, so the, the idea I think is what is to block the IgE, and that's why you know Genetics and, and Novartis has done for many years. So now it was the era of introducing biological to treat asthma. It is an expensive drug, but this is now we start to phenotype asthma and start the process of what we call personalized medicine. So if you look here, what we do here, this is the IgE produced by B cells. And to get, for example, when you see a cat, when you see grass pollen, you start to sneeze and you start to have rhinorrhea. The reason is in the reactions there because IgE will pass here and which will attach to what we call high affinity IgE receptor in the mast cell, causing degranulation of the mast cell and release of other mediators, like you know, histamine and other things, and then the system. So you can control that by blocking the IgE. And how do we block it? By using an antibody to IgE. So it will block it here in the way. And the drugs is very well known for many, many years, called only Zibam which is a drug that is useful for patients, but they have to have high IgE uh, level. Uh, they are more of the TH2 type side effects. So this is the first biological treatment that was introduced to us management. Now, how can we use these features to treat asthma? We said we have isonophilic severe asthma, we have neutrophilic severe. And we know that this will not respond to steroid. It will not also respond to anything that block the eosinophils. And if you remember from the cytokine, I show you this, this essential cytokine called IL-5. This IL-5 produced by T cell, it's essential for the development of eosinophil and for activation, differentiation, and survival. It has to prime those eosinophils to come to the airways. So companies thought, can we develop something to block this? And this is the basis for cytokine therapy. So what is here, the basis for that is that they will have an antibody that will block the cytokine from attaching to the receptor, or you can block the receptor, block the signaling. If you do that, then you might be able to block a user field and improve the information. But as I don't have time to show you. Many clinical trials failed in the beginning because we did not phenotype our patients. But once we start to phenotype our patients, that they have high number of eosinophil, either by sputum induction, we cannot do biopsy like this and find eosinophil, either by sputum induction and recently, as you're going to see, by blood, if I have certain level of eosinophil here, then, you know, there is a drug that has developed there called nubolizumab, which is an antibody to this one. And the persons really to see from 2009, because all the trial fell until 2009, when they start to identify those patients who have eosinophil, and they look at it in a clinical trials using sputum eosinophilia, and they find that this drugs really improve the uh, uh, FEV1, uh, uh, airway hyperresponsive doesn't affect and 
into the symptom, but the most important thing, it really prevents exacerbation. But people were reluctant to use it because here you have to do sputum induction. Until, you know, two studies came in New England Journal of Medicine, one by Elizabeth Bell from Netherlands and the other one from France, but it's about the center trials where they use blood eosinophilia. So when they use a blood eosinophilia to phenotype those patients, this is drug, mobilizumab, which is anti-cytopenic antibody work. I don't have the time to tell you that three companies work on that, and there's now three drugs that block IL-5. Two blocking the IL-5 alone, and one block the receptor from, uh, I think, Azrazidic. So, so there is now three drugs available in the market that we use to treat difficult to treat asthma who are isolated. Now, what about other side effects? These people will not respond to IR5 because there is mucus hyperproduction, there is demodering, there is sinusitis. For many years, people look to the alternative pathway. And this is IL4 and IL13. And these cytokines, they're not only important for IgE, as I said, but also for eosinophil, because those are important for we come up regulation and rolling of eosinophil here, and for the epithelium there, and for the remodeling. So they try to block each one in the way, but they fail. Because it will work, L13 will work. So they were thinking, how can they develop something, something to block both cytokines? Now we know that IL-4 receptors have two isotypes. One of them called alpha-8, alpha uh, uh, alpha and the other one, this one here, the other side of uh, receptors, is shared with IL-13. So if you block this receptor there, you block IL-4. But if you block the other receptors, which share with the IL-13, you block two cytokines. And after many trials, so now we now came with a drug which is available in Turkey, available here, called Tupimix or Tupimabab, which is an anti-receptor for this. And it will block IL-4 and IL-13. And it's not only effective in preventing exacerbation, it block what we call type 2 receptors. It does not prevent exacerbation into the symptom, but the most important thing, it really helped. I was in Turkey before that, the, actually the COVID, and then I gave lectures about this one to a group of respiratory physicians. This is one of the very newly discovered drugs that we are using there. I almost finished. Now, so we're starting now to think that maybe our theory of the sort of TH2 only theory is wrong because we have neutrophils. So what else can we bring these neutrophils and mediate the non-TH2. So now we are speaking, actually, if you look at this one, people are speaking of TH2 high and TH2 low. So if they are TH2 low, what is the thing that mediating that and can we block this one? Now this is a cytokine called IL-17 that when we look into the asthmatic individual, we found it a lot in the epithelium and also in the T cells, which is TH17. I'm going to show you what this. And that is responsible actually for the neutrophilia. Now, just for basic immunology, when we are exposed to an allergen, T cell will differentiate according to the milieu, to the, to the atmosphere, to either TH1. If we have a lot of interferon gamma, go to TH1. If we have R4, go to TH1. If we have TGF beta and MC parent, go to TH17, they produce IL17 and TNF. And this has been described very well in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. So that is what's happening on those neutrophilic asthma that they have this one. Unfortunately, the clinical trial that blocked the TS17 did not work so far. And we are stuck with endotrophilic asthma. We are using sometimes antibiotic like Zithromax, or, which have, you know, those macrolides. We can speak about them later. Now, what we will do for this, this is not an inflammation. What we are seeing here, we are seeing smooth muscle all over. You give steroid, you give IL-5, this one will not go. So, a company related to Harvard engineers have thought of this 
using the technology of radio frequency that we use in cardiac cardiology and vascular for ablation. For, when somebody has arrhythmia and we ablated the smooth muscle of the vastness, so they use the same technology. And they came with something called bronchial thermoplastic. So what does this bronchial thermoplastic? This is, you know, in Arabic we say the last type of treatment is cutteries. So this is what I, I'm going to try to show you a video. I'm sure you all know about it. What we do here, we go through a bronchoscope and we go into the airways and then open the forceps and apply radio frequency. And that rate of frequency will create some sort of heat, not very hot, 65 to 70 degree, that will eliminate the smooth muscle. So if you do that, you come three weeks later, the smooth muscle has disappeared. And that causes the airway to relax. And now we just finished a study after five years of the treatment of this, still the effect is there, they do not. But you have to phenotype your patient. If you use him just an inflammatory phenotype, it might not work. Now, let me try to show you. Uh, uh, okay, a video. Do I have a time, Dr. Meza? One minute. Okay. So, if I want to show you here, let me see. Can, can you move this video for me? This is the link. Okay, so that's thermoplasty is really, I, I'm sure it is available in Turkey. We have it here available. And it is, rather than this one. It's okay. Rather than, it wasn't. So, so I want to show With you. With normal breathing, the airways of the hear? lungs are hear? fully open. As yes, in this we can hear, but we cannot see it. People with oh, severe yes. asthma. You have to share it through the screen. Sorry about that. This excess muscle, together with inflammation of the airways, combine. With normal yes, breathing. Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Lungs okay. are fully open, so, as so in this, this cross is, section this is, of an this airway. Is, this is People with airway. severe asthma have more you airway smooth asthma. muscles circling their airways. See, this this excess muscle, together with inflammation of the airways, combines to make the airway walls thicker That's than normal. Easy to During an asthmatic attack, in response to an asthma trigger, such as an allergen or okay. irritant, the airway smooth muscle contracts, leading to airway noise and breathing difficulties. So During bronchial the thermoplasty, the a small flexible tube is advanced into the airway through a standard flexible bronchoscope placed through the mouth or nose. No incision is required. The Allaire device has an expandable wire electrode array at the tip, and when it is expanded, the four arms of the electrode array come in contact with and fit snugly against the airway wall. The expanded electrode array will then deliver controlled radio frequency energy for about 10 seconds to heat the airway smooth muscle. About one third of the targeted lung areas are treated during a single procedure. A total of three procedures are currently needed for complete treatment. Once the procedure is completed, the device and the bronchoscope are removed. The controlled energy delivered during bronchial thermoplasty creates mild heat within the airway wall that is designed to reduce the amount of airway smooth muscle. By reducing the amount of airway smooth muscle, the procedure reduces the ability of the airway walls to contract and narrow during an asthma attack. Okay, so, so, so basically, just the last slide, basically this needs three sessions uh, each session will take about an hour, and what we can, uh, uh, I mean, it has to be, we, we do one leg, the other leg twice we go for it, and we just leave the middle, the, all the lobe, but not the middle lobe, you know, because it's difficult to go through, and 
within if you biopsy the patients yeah if you biopsy the patients you can you know they start first doing it on a dog and then a human now that you see the smooth muscle disappear and those bulks of the smooth muscle they disappear and the airway is open now sometimes for unfortunate patients the airway is like this plenty of fibrosis we have no treatment for no, there's nothing to, to really treat fibrosis. You know, people who deal with pulmonary fibrosis or fibrosis, we don't have drugs to really treat fibrosis. That's a problem. Unfortunately, they are very small groups. So just in summary, I want to tell you that asthma is now not a single disease, it is a syndrome. And there is multiple phenotypes. We all die in medicine. I'm sure Dr. Mathieu will tell you in nephrology, we speak about phenotype and personalized medicine. And we have to change the concept of our clinician and student in particular, that they should not look to those complex diseases. Now we do a lot of bioinformatics, I don't want to do, we do a lot of biomarker, but the, the message here is we should not look to those complex diseases as a single disease. And what is good for Muhammad is not good for Ahmed. You know, we have to personalize the medicine and phenotype them. For example, if you have an obese asthmatic, they will not respond well to steroid. If you have smoking asthmatic, we know smoking interferes with steroid. So we have to look into the patient, but you know, the doctors in general, drugs company, they want to give the one drug to everybody, one fit all. It doesn't work like that. It was before, and I think this is what we are expecting from our students, our new doctors, to really go deep into that one and speak about phenotype and I hope I, I gave you a sort of like simple explanation of work we've been doing for all of us 20 years. And we I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. Thank you very much, uh, the, uh, the education department there. It was very good communication. I didn't have any problem. And I look forward to see you in person or even if you need an hour, uh, we will be there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hamid. Uh, Professor Kutebe, um, this was an excellent talk. I learned a lot of things, but before we uh, thank you and, and meeting, uh, I will be looking forward to hearing if they have any questions. But till then, you have forwarded me a question which I have noted down. You asked me about the vitamin D deficiency in Turkey. I don't have the exact numbers, but in clinical practice, we all see in internal medicine, in general medicine that the vitamin D levels are low in our population as well. And if you go into the outpatient clinic now, even I did my outpatient clinic yesterday, I have prescribed at least uh, to one third of my patients vitamin D we need to give them. And we are all aware that it's important for the immune system, but it's also important for our chronic kidney disease patients and et cetera, but that's how things are going on. And Oh. Yeah, I mean, just to tell you, my family, we were all vitamin D efficient in the clinic. When I came to United Arab Emirates, thinking that we'll have more vitamin D, we just tested all because the vitamin D doesn't go through the face or the hands. And a lot of people here covered, and also they are inside, they don't go outside a lot. So, this is a major problem actually in the United Arab Emirates. And, and, and I guess going through the pandemic during the last year, everyone is at home. And though we were out in the summer, but it wasn't like uh, previous time. So everyone is uh, on vitamin D if they are in need of it. And I have- well, Fortunately, fortunately, COVID-19 and mild and moderate asthma are, mild and moderate asthma is not comorbidity for COVID-19. Severe asthma is. In fact, if any, we find that there is less COVID-19 in my heart in the allergic because of the cytokines. They don't develop the cytokine storm that they develop in COPD, no L6, alpha. So that's what the severe asthma, if they got COVID-19, they are trouble. Well, this is, this is an uh, interesting observation. Of course, uh, our kidney patients are not that lucky in terms of COVID-19 and if you look at all the uh, registered data that had been going on, they had the worst survival and we were working for it with the vaccination and things like that. But another thing that I have written down while you were uh, at the beginning of the talk, 
uh, you were telling us that this is not a single gene disease. This is not one type of disease. This is like a syndrome or uh, there are more phenotypes to the disease. But have you ever discovered uh, there is an ethnicity preference of the disease? You're talking about the phenotypes or different uh, presentation of the disease being it severe other than all the other confounding factors like smoke or the pollution or environment. Yeah, we have you now we have very active group here in the bioinformatic trying to identify biomarker from the saliva mm -hmm. that will predict the severe asthma phenotype. You know, because we cannot do always biopsy and also you know uh, steroids. So, and we have identified a group of genes actually. We just published some of them that predict that this patient will go to more of severe disease, which are associated a lot of them with steroid responsiveness. So we have to use bioinformatics, and now this is need a big population of patients, and that's why collaboration is important. In the NIH like center that I think some of you attended the NIH talk, you know, uh, is that this is where we're going to big core to identify this from non-invasive biomarker of this uh, disease. Uh, what can this be different Turkey from UAE? Or from, I believe that asthma in the Middle East is quite different from asthma in the West. There is certainly something that we have to look at it from the environment and also the way we treat it. Unfortunately, we all treat according to international guidelines, which I, you know, the guidelines for severe asthma I wrote, but here it's not different, it's different. You know, we treat it because we don't have a good cohort of patients that uh, but there is, they look at it and they do this multi center trials. Okay, thank you. And one last thing you also touched upon was um, the immune response or the allergic response of the people and the children and the vaccination programs. And what is your uh, perspective view of this one year or two years of lockdown? What will it bring in terms of asthma in the next five years, 10 years? Uh, what do you see in the future in terms of the disease? Uh, actually, the, the news, actually, the news, it's a bad news. The reason why, one of them will see more obesity. That's one of them. No exercise. No exposure to microbiome. Everybody wearing now the mask. Is that right? So, I mean, I, I'm sure in your family and other family, people for a whole year now, they didn't have cold. So the normal environment, you know, sort of like this is the, this is will really disturb our immune response, you know. That's why, you know, I advise people at home, you know, open the windows, you know, try to get something normal because this is not normal. What we are doing is not normal. You know, is is please basically sitting with your daughter and wearing this one, this is not normal. The other thing is that we are finding, and now we have established a virtual clinic. This patient used to go to hospitals when they have symptoms, mild symptoms. Now, unless the patient is severe, they don't go to the hospital because they are afraid from the hospital. And some of the hospitals are particularly overloaded by COVID. So we are seeing more patients who are difficult to treat because he will take, he will go to the pharmacy, take one day, the drug will finish, he will not repeat it, you know? So this is actually, we're going to see it in nephrology, we're going to see it in in uh, asthma, in COPD, in cancer in particular, that after the era here, we discovered more cases that are not very controlled. Now, the other thing is, you know, when they are in these rooms, you know, the, the atmosphere is not really very fresh. And uh, a lot of people now, you know, one of the things that people use without drug uh, prescription, they got cold. Oh, this COVID-19, you know, immediately. And they go and take erythromycin or zithromycin. Every clinician. So people have stuck off Zithromax at home thinking that that's what will treat the virus. It doesn't treat the virus, you know? And this is going to, certainly we will end up with this virus. That happened also in other uh, pandemic, that people in your response and we might see surge of allergy. Yes, indeed. I don't see any more questions, so I would like to thank you, but I have one last comment. I have to thank Esma because you were referring to her during your lecture and I have to you know, say good words about my friend as well. I know you're not hearing about uh, her voice during the night because 
probably she's not snoring anyway. <laughs> but... <laughs> I snore, I snore. <laughs> snore. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for once more being with us and sharing the update um, information about asthma and the other diseases. And we are looking very much forward to hosting Besma Lam soon or at another webinar. Till then, please stay safe and thanks once more for my friends and everyone around here in Bezmailam. Thank you. My, my IT here person is with me, you know, thinking I'm not very good. So, because, you know, she was trying to save me. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you. You did great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Severin. Seven, seven, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I do that. The dean, actually, I don't know if she's still the dean which we met here, but thank them all for me. All right, thank you very much. Brian, say hi to Brian for me. Let's say hi to Brian for me. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.